Uh, Junior Silva with StorageCraft. I've been with StorageCraft for about five years and we're excited in the product management. Like Google said, we spent a lot of time with listening to the market, listening to our customer and hundreds and hundreds of people that we've, we've met and talked with to come up with this solution. Um, the biggest thing with, with StorageCraft, tra traditionally, we've, uh, you know, we had great product, great technology, but it was very product centric. And so it was like, create that thing and put that thing with that product and then make it all work, right? Um, as was well created this platform, so this is our one system and management interface. Um, so I'm gonna log in and tell you, show you how it is. So more of a modern look and feel. Okay, back in the day, one system was just software as a service. Can I run it on-prem now? Ye yes. yes, you can run it on-prem. Yeah. Okay, but so even one system today can Yeah, so you've been able to run uh, one system, which is our cloud-based management for the majority of people. But for those that have wanted to run it on-premises, they can actually deploy it as an OVA in their, as a VM. Um, but now with oh, one system... Slugworth is coming after me. Yeah. <laughs> it's, so now with one system, now you do the data protection and all the storage management through one system. Yep, very good. Exactly. Um, one, of, one of the biggest things on, on this uh, architecture, talk you a little bit... You know, besides like just a, we didn't want to have just a pretty dashboard, right? It's like, it's modular, whatever. But we wanted to have it a, a something that was, was actually underneath that was tied with really good technology. And so um, this is based on a microservices architecture. So you, you hear a lot, it's just like you have these microservices, you're able to, to scale those, you're able to have performance out of those special services. All of those microservices filter in into that system health, right? We wanted to create a dashboard that was, you could literally log in and log out, right? You log in, you see green across the top and log out. That was kind of the, the design as, as we were going for this. But also these microservices, um, they're, they're not just like, oh, can I talk to or can I have some information? It's, can I, it's like, for example, a storage service. It's going, okay, it's doing a little health check and it's doing some, some analytics on itself and being able to say, oh, th those mounts are no longer mounted. Let me go ahead and remount them, right? So it's not waiting for something to happen and then you're coming in as the admin after the fact. It's, it's doing that proactive approach. And so part of these microservices, we wanted to keep scaling those. Um, all the communication on it is with uh, uh, Google RPC, gRPC. So it's all gRPC based. So everything, uh, we wanted something highly scalable, but highly, highly performant as well. Any questions on the architecture of that? So what is actually the benefit that you're getting by using microservices here? The benefit that you're getting is going to be the delivery mechanism. So you can have it in a virtual machine. You can have it in a Docker container. You can have it orchestrated in, in a bunch of different ways. So the, those microservices, they can be arranged and you can turn on and off. And it's always the same code. So, so basically, you're creating field flexibility or platform for the future. Basically. Yes. Yeah. That's that's what basically yes. I was trying to ask that. Yeah. So that everyone else also understands that why you've actually done it because <laughs> yeah. you didn't really say that. <laughs> but implementation but flexibility. The, yep. Yes. Was cool isn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> it is containers and drink. Yeah. Question. Yeah. One. Three eight to one dedupe ratio. That just made me think of what's your block size you're using for deduplication. On the, you want to yeah, the question? block size is, uh, is variable length, so that'll be, it ranges from like 16 to 64K, depending upon mm -hmm. the sliding, uh, variable length. Okay, thank you. Right. Yep, great question. Yeah, so with the, it also makes it really easy for expanding on, on the support, for example. So we have, uh, you know, vSphere uh, 6, 7 comes out, new API. Instead of going and touching all the parts of the development code and trying to get you know th this API on the backup and replication and all these things, we could go to one service. You add support for that, and all the other microservices have access to that information now. And so nothing changes on the, their communication. So it makes it for like Google was saying, we wanted to do rapid development and, and bring on these support on new technologies and also anything new coming up. Uh, we want to go with our market and, and bring that to the table. The second piece, it's a pretty standard, but it's, it's always answering, you know, what are my blind spots, right? Is there anything that I should be protecting that I'm not? Usually data protection comes as a, as a secondary uh, thought. They're like, you're worried about getting your production VMs up and running, 
and they're like, oh, I was supposed to. And this part, the, we, we agree, it's, it's not a, a set it and forget it. It's something, okay, catch it for me, but you're always gonna have to do you know, DR testing. We, we always go for best practices, do, do your testing on the DR, make sure it's, you can restore all of those things. Don't just forget it because one day you're gonna come back when you need it and it's not gonna be in a good state. So, but we wanted to make sure that you could do that. You can ignore clusters, you can ignore hosts, any of the dev uh, stuff you're gonna do. And then bringing it all together, also the things that you are protecting, what's their protection status. On the data usage side, we wanted to, uh, a lot of people have asked like, well, what about, you know, you ask how much data is it, are you changing in your environment? And, and no one has a, has a good answer for, you know, what, what's the data is changing like. And so we wanted to bring on the data protection side, we're able, we're tracking all those, those changes. And so we're able to, uh, with some of the acquisitions, create and, and be able to figure out <laughs> data change rate. So with the data usage and the data change rate, are you able to do any kind of analytics and reporting and forecasting for future storage needs out of that? Yes, we do. And, and that's exactly uh, what we're doing. I can hop in on that side. I'll just kind of go with you guys wherever you want to go with this. Um, to give you an idea, so in our analytics side, on our capacity planning, um, we're able to, you see the, the different uh, storage locations. You can see it in percentage if you want, but drilling in, and then you can see that it's, it's going to be um, about how long you have before you hit your threshold. Uh, threshold. Uh, it's 80% right now or when you're going to be running out of say. So what we, we want to trend that, but also not just data protection. Sometimes you're looking, oh, we're consuming this much. Um, we took the first approach of, you know what, when you run out of space, it's going to be a bad day. <laughs> so no matter what it is, let's change that consumption on that storage. So uh, try to take more of a holistic approach to that. Well, we wanted to, uh, this, this special dashboard, making it more of a, an experience that an IT admin can actually give valuable data, not just like fluff data, but like truly have a, a view into their, uh, to their environments. So if you have like multiple sites or data centers, um, it shows up over here different. You can select a different site and this whole dashboard, all of the information on it, the change rate for that site, all of those things come up and, and refresh accordingly. And this is customizable? Uh, this one for uh, V1, it's not customizable, but um, we're bringing uh, a lot of cool things coming up. <laughs> we wanted to make it more of a, a modular, but definitely uh, being able to, to leverage that and, and use it for across the whole environment. Great question. Um, also, you, one of the, the cool things, you saw kind of that darker mode. It's a little bit darker on the screen, but this, um, we wanted as, as IT, uh, professionals who <laughs> work in late hours, we're doing all sorts of things. We also have uh, these big monitors that you can put stuff on. Um, but being able to something have something really nice that that you can do and you know have it in a throw it up in in a knock view mode um, and be able to see all of of this in kind of your knock view. And you can have this monitor and manage multiple systems, correct? Yes, absolutely. I see this overview where you have different storage systems here. One overview? Uh, uh, different storage, yes. In, so let me go in here. Right again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, I like good. dark, but not on this projector. <laughs> on this projector, it's not doing that. You guys can see on my screen after. Um, you are dark. And you were asking about uh, the storage, being able to see different storage views. Is that? Yeah, so on this, you can scroll through and, and, uh, and see those if you're just going after a quick little uh, view. If you wanted to get in deeper, we have that capacity uh, view that I showed. Or in configuration, this is also a place where it's all of your storage locations are here, um, also per site. All of this information is, you know, you can search, you know, on, on DRAS, uh, OneSafe, Whichever information over here, it's, it's all in a single site, but you can have all of your sites into a single view of, of the storage. Can I just ask a quick question about the kind of workloads that are being protected? So your primary focus is on uh, VMware-based uh, hypervisors, so VMware. Yeah. Um, so virtual machines, yes, is traditional. Yes. You save that. Uh, file services, probably. Do you say if someone was running PKS, 
those kind of workloads, do you still protect those as well and restore in the same way? Um, is yep. everything covered is what I'm trying to <laughs> mm -hmm. ask. Um, it, it depends on, on where, who's servicing, where, where that sits, right? If it's on the, the storage side, if, if we're servicing over NFS and we can protect it in the CDP-like fashion, then we could do it that way. Or on, on VM or on this side, we're doing obviously virtual machines via the hypervisor layer. Um, and also via the agent, if you want a, a little bit more integrated uh, with uh, VSS integration and things like that, you can do it that way. So on PKS, they are, um, where do they, they service those from? Good question. <laughs> uh, it depends on the so, context I mean, of how you're having them running. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, I mean, <coughs> I wouldn't assume that VSS wouldn't be there. Container service, right? Yeah, yeah, container service. So, and again, that, that was going to be my next question, that you, you mentioned, you've mentioned VSS a few times. What yes. about Linux workloads and all those kind of things? Uh, doing it? Because we have, haven't even started talking about the application consistency <laughs> that yeah. I think came up earlier in the presentation, and we were waiting for this Correct. demo. So can you please mm -hmm. go into all of those things? Yes. We have so, yes, so many questions. With whatever time you have left. <laughs> <laughs> I can. Um, tradition with StorageCraft, uh, we're... We have a certified provider with a VSS provider that that's how it's been our, our bread and butter, right? Uh, in the very beginning, uh, we've OEM'd that driver for a lot of people. And a lot of people built uh, good companies out of that. Um, our, that technology, we wanted to now turn it into and, and be, you know what, we're going to take care. We're going to be the front. We're still going to leverage that. Um, and it was a little interesting when we were going through uh, in this project, nothing, nothing was off limits. And uh, we, we took our, our Shadow Protect, which is our, our software right now, and we just layered that onion all the way down to, okay, what are we going to take into this platform? And it just came the driver. <laughs> the driver was the only thing that came. We put a little gRPC service on top. And uh, so uh, our agent-based protection, it's about uh, 10 megabytes, and it sits idle at a 1.6 megabytes. So just super light uh, backup footprint uh, in, in an environment. Uh, the VSS integration, we um, obviously we try to take an application consistent. Uh, we feel that that's the best you know, quality of restore you're going to have. Um, so we, we try to do it through the VMware tools if it's installed. We try to, to go a few different ways and kind of fail over. Um, and then at the very latest, we say, okay, we weren't able to do that. Let's go ahead and take a crash consistent. So at least you have something. Um, but then we, the agent-based protection is going to be the, the tightest integration um, with our, our VSS provider. So if nothing else works, you have an agent to fall yes. back on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Still, we haven't answered the container question, obviously. So, so if, you, you, if you asked back a question of me, then, then that basically means that containers aren't covered, right? In the sense, uh, it depends where they live. That, that's why I, I the containers would likely be sitting inside of a VM at that point. At which point, you're you're looking at the underlying part, and the, your protection recovery mechanism is to restore that VM. At which point, it affects the underlying parts of it. Yeah. But you can't necessarily go into I want to modify this particular, restore this sub portion of it without having to get your hands dirty, basically with you know kube commands and such. I yeah. guess I guess yeah. that's that's pretty much it. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it, like and it's not directly VM, so there's no VSS. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's it's a train wreck with any button, anyone trying to integrate with PKS or just native Kubernetes and stuff like that. So it's it's everyone's problem, effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in in the containers, they they you know in theory they're supposed to be very stateless. Um, they're not built. I like the theory on that. <laughs> they're, not, they're not built very stateless. In, in uh, theory, yeah, in theory, theory yes. and practice are the same thing. In reality, not so much. Serverless, no, no servers. I mean, right. And so the, that that causes a bunch of different where are they storing that data, you know. And then can you, you know, leverage the the mechanisms like Kubernetes or things to actually you don't need that state or, um, you know, how how can you connect to all so you keep in state somewhere else. Um, that, that's all the architecture mm -hmm. stuff. All right, let's, uh, let's go to vSphere over here, make sure everything is How do you get the uh, vSphere web client to do anything in 20 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's actually the, the greatest part. Cause by by it running vSphere 7. It, it, takes longer, it takes longer for the VM API to create the VM <laughs> and power it on than it does for us to do a restore. 
Um, but you get you get the that's a better answer on it. Yeah, idea. so you do your part really fast, and we just have to wait for the thing. <laughs> yes, that makes so problems. Here's it actually doesn't matter, matter how many milliseconds it is. You're faster than vCenter. That's all that matters. Yeah. That's all that matters, right? Yes. And uh, so in a we do a very everything like we were saying like a three step process. So we've met um, a lot of times with VMware and and just going through um, how many clicks are we're doing things in. And uh, so we wanted to just create this very simple experience. It's a three-step, uh, select a machine. We, we bring in the best optimal route. So if you leave this optimal, it will bring in the, you know, the fastest storage that we can find available uh, in your data center. We'll be able to, to do the recovery from there. Or you can select saying, you know what, I want to restore the recovery point from the cloud, or I want to restore from uh, my secondary storage. So in this instance, I'll just leave optimal. I'll select the date and time. Notice that um, we, we keep all the, the VMware native metadata. Uh, it's all DRS aware, so all of this information is, is coming in and we select, we know the, the permissions, how everything is set underneath. So just trying to simplify the restore process so you don't mm. uh, make a mistake. And this is restore to original source? Uh, correct. And if I wanted to restore to an alternate source, a different vCenter or a different host, it would be just as fast? Yes. Okay. Okay. And, and the, the, the point over here, just to kind of, we'll do one of these. We usually put a recovery point uh, time over here. Uh, sometimes you're doing a test restores and, and you're trying to find where the data is. It makes it easy for you to That's nice. figure out after the fact on, on a VM. But you can change it, whatever you want. Is there uh, a limit to the number of restore points that uh, can happen at any given time? Uh, what was the question again? Is there a maximum number of snapshots or restore points that I can have? No. What about There's the size of the machine? Does that impact like this at lines. all? The sizing, uh, the machine that we've taken for, yeah. that we've done all our testing on, it's a 500 gig machine. Okay. And that was the 20 millisecond number. Okay. Uh, it used to take, uh, with our, in 2016, so two years ago when we won the best of VM world, we took a VM and it used to take 10 seconds. Um, so we've, we talked about this innovation. We wanted to keep innovating and driving this. So that's where we got it down to. Uh, on, so two years ago, it used to be just SMB locations. Now, anywhere that we have uh, mount points, so NFS, SMB, iSCSI, our cloud, you can, you can virtual, we call it virtual boot is this technology or hyper restore. You can do it from a cloud directly on your, you know, your own site. Yeah. Well, actually, that's making me think of, can I do a restore to, to VMware on AWS? Well, or not on VMware, on somewhere else, right? Well, the, yeah, because it did say you can do it to other platforms. Yeah, yeah but, but yep. yeah, I'm they're just going baby yes. steps. Can, yep. can do and is a good idea are not necessarily <laughs> the same thing. Uh, when you need to do it, you might need to do it, though. Marketing says we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to tell support that? I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm generally Marketing in favor of instant restore and yeah. deal with the fact that the storage that the backup is on is slow. Yeah. But in the market you sell into, instant restore to an image that's in S3 is going to do like 0.5 IOPS till the restore you know, from 20 milliseconds till all the data is copied back? Well, that's, that's the, the biggest difference. And I'll show you over here, and I'll, I'll touch, I'll double click on, on that point. Um, so let, let's give a, a little name, a favorite superheroes or yeah. Wonder anything. Woman. Chris. Wonder Woman. Yeah, I, I, I name everything just cats, you know, <laughs> makes it easy. Okay, and so Specific I'll just come over here cats. so we should see it uh, pop up just in here. And so it could cats. have been Catwoman. Okay, ready? There you go. Okay. He's a superhero nope. and villain. Is this live demo time? Uh, more. This is live demo time. Here's Here. Wonder Woman. We had a question coming from another delegate who's not in the room. And here's the the VM already spun. It's V Center at this point, right? Yep. So there we are going. Somebody through, else asked. Through the um, do yep. you have to search by VM name, or you can can you use other criteria like um, tags or something like that? Um, right now, it's uh, it's VM names, but we are uh, com bringing up uh, tagging. Is that a stateful system. restore? Like we're back to the current state of the operating system, or is that a it's currently booting up? It's it's a uh, it's currently booting. It's, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. 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 I couldn't this see that the, at the bottom. Yep, but this is purely uh, NFS snapshots being mounted to VMware 
which boots up the machine, right? Or is it no no need <laughs> to mount? This is the biggest difference. Yeah, That's a good right question. Yeah. So with the uh, uh, there's we we like to talk about restore versus recovery, right? Recovery is kind of like okay, get this thing up, mount it, you know, expose an NFS, mount it, and have it over here. Then you still have to V motion that back to the, your primary storage, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What we're talking about here with our, our patented biotechnology, you're, you're creating the VMDK directly on primary. And so as the machine is, is booting up, we take just the, the initial information that we're able to, you know, with the bitmap and, and getting that. So the machine starts up, as we are intelligently backfilling on the disk, those areas for the OS. So what you notice over here, just to give an example, yeah. once it's, the data has been read in, it's sitting in primary storage. So mm -hmm. it is like a snapshot folder in your primary storage where the, the additional well, we data can is we, being... If we look in the, in, in the vSphere web client, we'll actually be able yeah. to see the, the target where it's yeah, physically it's, sitting up. Yeah, okay. But, I want to yep. know what we see on screen right now is that was a crash consistent snapshot. Can I do that with application yes. and operating system consistent? Yes. Yeah. And, and also physical. You, so uh, when you do protect with our agent base, a uh, physical server, you can do this exact thing inside vSphere. Okay, so what's going on here now is your VIO filter is intercepting re requests. Yes. If it's data we haven't seen before, it's getting it from the backup yes. copy and pushing it to the primary. Yes. And if it's data we've already seen before, it's reading it from the primary because we already did that. Exactly. Is it also in the background streaming? Yes. Okay. And it's and it's intelligently as so well, as that, that makes the run from slow storage less stupid. Yeah. yeah. Because mm -hmm. as as opposed to the the V motion it back where that makes the system slower. Yeah. You're going to get faster and faster, faster as more faster. and more of the data makes exactly. it the primary storage. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's why even I can have a point that's sitting in a cloud. So it, it's in a cloud. Yeah, and, I can, and for the first 30 seconds, it's going to be really yeah, interesting. It's going to be time, slow. Gonna catch up. In, and, just, and then we do the intelligently. We, we start getting reads in a certain area, and we just we read ahead in the area of the disk. Yeah, yeah, those yeah, reads yeah. are close together. That's yeah. nice. And so, so we keep flipping back and forth. So yeah. as this is this yeah. is and, and, and Howard, that's where the hard drive versus all flash hyper restore is the same amount of time. It's just a question about that back end right. well, process. How, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's the difference. How if you well want. it works after. Yes. <laughs> So yeah. Fundamentally, you're saying I could technically do this off of tape because I hate myself, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't support we, we, tape. We don't, we don't support don't, tape. Don't, you never go don't hate tape. yourself. Unintelligent. <laughs> <laughs> but to give you to that exact point that you were talking about, the so in I've never opened up, example Chrome on this, right? So the first time that I open up, you get that initial that read uh, that's coming yeah, up you're, okay you're essentially downloading chrome from your backup storage to the primary yeah and then the yep. next time you open and then, it, it's going to open right away mm -hmm. yep and then which means if it's your database oh. the indices are going to come first because i'm going to access the indices right. right away and then the data as i access it and the cold data will take a long time yes yep. but that's kind of the way we want it to work yeah mm -hmm. yep does that also mean that you know because you're streaming all of that whatever you don't have so if you, are you relying also on the fact that uh, the faster you have all those components, the, the, the faster you can suck the data in, the faster the restore becomes over yes. time. Yes. So it, it then is worth investing or making those channels better so that you can restore quicker as well. If, if you want, the, the biggest thing is going to be that latency. So depending of where it's going to be that those reads are going to be coming in and that data, uh, you can do that. And so in uh, even like something like an S3, you go through a storage gateway or something like that. Like you're able to get that, the, the biggest problem that you have is, is having that extra, you know, you'll get all your data up there, but like where your machine was originally, it was on, on premise, right? And so you being able to, to bring it back to, to that original state with all the, the native information that you have, that's the, the biggest key. So fundamentally, in 10 milliseconds or thereabouts, you're restoring basically the header, after which point everything then starts ingesting as it's being accessed. Yes. So we're getting, we're getting the, and that's what it was, like it was the best of both worlds, right? It's, it's easy to restore, you know. 64 kilobytes, and then load up, you know, a three terabyte operating system and, and data in post, basically. 
Mm-hmm. And since you're not using all that stuff immediately, it works very well from an efficiency standpoint. And, yes. like and somewhere in the console I can see, because I mean, to me, this is a restore in progress. Yeah. You know, and at it some is. point, I want to know when all when the yeah, last no. byte of data yeah. came. Yeah, yeah. You can you can force it if you want up front. If uh, we have a right here to give you, you can say. Um, let me go into well, that restore. Again. Being able to force <laughs> it when I start the restore is okay. But I also want to monitor how much of my data has been. Right. And I want to go. You know, this one's still running slow. Mm-hmm. Force it now, word, yes. not well, at the beginning. Well, you have both options. Okay. So you can do, if you select this button right here, the migrate data to a vSphere. This, it would still give you all the benefits that we just did, the, the instant all, all that stuff. But it will say, I, I want to go from all the way till the end of this disk. I want to keep backfilling. So it will do that. And so what it will do, it will do the intelligent. So if I don't check that, my coldest data that I never access will never get restored? It, eventually, as, as you get restored, this will be for a test. So if you're doing a test restore, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't get that cold data unless you right. access to it. Right. Or if but, you want to if you, you have to access it, or will it eventually just come over in the absence of doing anything? Uh, without doing anything, that, that data wouldn't be coming over. If you wanted to say, let's say after the fact, you started up one of these restores and say, you know what, I do want to. You just go in this okay. here, you first, say start a snapshot. All, I need it at setup time to be able to make selecting that box the default. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. I'm restoring, yeah. and if some of the data is never on my primary storage, then, yeah. then it's not protected because mm-hmm. it's only Correct. here, not here. Mm-hmm. Um, so yep. I need to be able to say, do that. And I want some control over priority. Mm-hmm. Okay. That, that I want to say, this is a really important VM move all of its data back from the secondary storage to the primary storage post haste subido database yes. first each yeah. you, you have yeah. yes well, one of the most important <laughs> stuff important. to happen first well, right yeah. whether i have to tell you or whether you can no, I've got magically to, ascertain that yeah but you've got to be able to get rid of that backup at some, some point. point and forever is not okay yeah. yeah and that's why so this is so let's say the use case is right you test my great restore right Testing, if I wanted to just test uh, a few sure terabyte VM, right? right? I can just spin it up, see the data, test whatever I want, right. and shut it down, yes, destroy yes, it. Yes, that was application consistent. Yes, and, 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 okay. and there's very little data that it's got consumed into my expensive primary storage, yeah. right? All right. So I, I, I want it to be an option, but, yes. but yes. which is the default you want to be able to should be, should be default a setup yes. option. Yes. So, yes. Also, I would just wanted to say that, you know, does that also mean that for every machine, you keep some data already on primary storage that never leaves so that you have this head start while everything else is streaming in? If not, then why not? And no, it's metadata. Because that wouldn't do you any good if you, the yeah. primary storage failed. Yeah. That's true. But <clears throat> while we are assuming that if it fails, so, so if, for example, there it's, is something... It's backup. Needs. We assume things are going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> no. At some point. Yeah. Okay, there's so hey, there's truth to that. Yeah. A, we just do a set and forget it. It's okay. In a single point instance, I'm restoring a single VM. I go and I open up Chrome for the first time. It's all great. If I'm restoring 10 VMs at the same time, do each of them have to open up Chrome for the first time for it to be available? Or uh, the locality of reference of those blocks having been accessed makes it available to all of them having been pulled down, if from a cloud or something? Uh, oh, because, because the... Because the oh. VMDK in primary, it's its own um, encapsulated oh, yeah. disk. So they're each bubbled. They're or each going to bubble okay. up as they go. Yeah. If yeah. you did the magic, I'd well, you know, be nice to know. <laughs> yeah. You know. yeah, it rehydrates on the way. Yeah. yeah. Do There's I have cool to use your GUI or is there an API that I can orchestrate my Ooh. own work? Everything you can do, we consume our own APIs, so we expose that as well. JSON, YAML, you know. Uh, right now, we do uh, GraphQL um, and... There, we, we can do no, we don't do JSON or no YAML yet, but in our roadmap. But we don't expose those to customers. Okay. Right. Well, we're not just customers. <laughs> <laughs> Even Come special on. customers. <laughs> <laughs> in this shit. No, great questions. Um, as, as far as the, on the, we talked about on the policy uh, orchestration piece, um, one of the, the biggest things is, you know, we, we, we've, went through about 40 iterations of different UX designs with multiple designers all over to 
come up with uh, this, this simplicity. So the biggest thing is like, you know, you don't have to go into a policy to go figure out what is that policy doing. So we went more of like a, a streamlined like card view, you know, the name, number of machines, you can click and filter. So you can work with this policy and it's not just oh, apply this policy. Mm -hmm. um, site, RPO, destination, free and use space. Also, as you're applying a policy, you can know that information ahead of time before doing so. And then giving you a little protection flow on that. A lot of time spent, like uh, we were talking about on the, like cloning, it's like one click, two clicks, three, four, done, right? So being able to, to do these operations that you would do in, in a daily basis, it's two, three clicks, four clicks, and you're done, right? Um, so we spent a lot of time refining that uh, to be the simplest path. And, and we hope to keep going with that on the platform. Everything is just, uh, even the restore, you saw that was a three click restore, was, or for testing purposes, right? If I wanted to restore, I would click that fourth click on the migrate to data to vSphere. So how do you select which VMs you want to part of a certain policy? Yep. Great question. So everything was discovered in vSphere uh, into this. Um, we want to make sure that everything, you, you remember IPs or names, sometimes is a 10.30 IP, make it a very fast for you to search through. Um, be able to also layer that with some other names like SRV. And then you select the machine, assign, and then you see the, your policies. Again, all the information that we saw before it's sitting right here, so I don't have to go check it out which one that I want. I can just select. What's your minimum RPO? Go. Is it 15 minutes? Right now it's 15 minutes. Okay. And you say? Agentless, correct. So crash consistent 15 minute RPO. Correct. Perfect. So is there like a service level agreement, SLA kind of um, thing where you can select or automatically add VMs to a certain policies. So right now it will be it's yet. global um, but Work on a tagging. per policy. Tags, yeah. tags. Yep. Tagging. Yeah. We're really excited about uh, our new platform and, and just keep delivering this simplicity and just performance. Uh, keep looking forward for the next uh, technology advances that we're going to show up. So thank you.